anything. I, sh I shared my screen. Okay, yep. we're recording. You're good. We're recording now. Okay, great. Is it? Thank okay, you. great. Well, first off, uh, I wanted to say sorry, everyone, for not making it in person, just with the, the weather and uh, and everything. I know it is sunny outside, but uh, it's a bit windy still, and I do not want to drift off the road right before the holidays and, and, and do that. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to attend virtually here. So um, I wanted to say thanks uh, uh, to Mayor Cavanaugh and Mayor Madison there. Uh, great, uh, sounds like a lot of great projects in the region. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, to hear that uh, some of uh, USDOT and Federal Highways discretionary grants are uh, going to be put to some great use there. So that actually that, that John Deere Road project um, that Mayor Cavanaugh mentioned uh, a few years ago, I came out for a, a road safety audit out there uh, with some folks from Intrans and, and uh, DOT and, and uh, Governor's Traffic Safety Bureau. So I, I know that, that that corridor there. And so that project, uh, I'm glad to see something's come into fruition there. So. Um, let's see here. All right. So diving right in uh, here today to talk to everybody about safe systems approach. Um, this is it's it's about a year old uh, with Federal Highway. Um, it was uh, uh, rolled out last last spring as part of our uh, NRSS National Roadway Safety Strategy. Um, and it's it's our strategy for getting to zero fatalities. So. <clears throat> Come on, advance. There we go. All right, technology is working. So hopefully everybody can imagine, you know, our country as a place where where nobody's going to die, where everybody gets to come home, where we don't have the worry like I did today of oh, I don't want to slide off the road in these uh, treacherous conditions. So um, our our mission is to try and reduce the fatalities out there. Just to paint a little bit of a picture here, these are mm, a few years old. These numbers, but. Uh, Globally, we're killing well over a million people uh, on our road on the roadways. Uh, this is this number of 36,000 was from 2018. 2020, as I understand, was 42,000. So that's a lot of a lot of body bags out there on the roadway. Um, well over 6,000 and rising fatal uh, pedestrians uh, on our roadway. So it certainly is a, a uh, an epidemic that we need to uh, try to reverse. So hopefully, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, this is just showing the trends here over the last uh, decade or so here. You know, we were in the low 30s, but now we're, uh, nationally we're getting up uh, into the 40s even. So we're at the high 30s and, and low 40s now. So we're going in the wrong direction. Pedestrian fatalities, again, the same thing. We're going in the wrong direction. So we need to do something to to reverse this. And so our goal to to get there is with safe systems. So safe systems is an approach that aims to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries. Um, so in the past, it was, the focus was elimination of crashes. You know what, crashes are going to uh, happen. So with safe system, it's accommodating those human mistakes, but it's also keeping those impacts to the humans at acceptable, tolerable levels. So that way people get to go home, be with their families for the holidays, just be with their families for dinner that evening. So this is a graphic that Federal Highway developed depicting uh, the principles and elements of the safe system. We're going to go through real quick. Six uh, safe system principles are seen on the outside of this graphic here. Uh, the death and serious injuries is unacceptable. We have that's first and foremost. We need to accept that and and abide by that. You know, who, humans make mistakes. We've all made mistakes. I made I've made mistakes. More so when I was younger, but I still to this day, um, you know, how many people have, you know what, that phone has rung or, you know, you hear that text message, you pick it up. That's a mistake. You're being distracted there. Um, but it's human nature. Humans are vulnerable. You know, we are fragile beings. Uh, it doesn't take much to, to end a life there. Um, responsibility is shared. It's not just the engineers and planners um, and, and policymakers in the room. Uh, it's it's everybody. Try to be proactive and also redundancy is crucial there. So we'll go into a little bit more detail on all those shortly. Also, we have five safe system elements, as you see here, safer roads, safe vehicles, safe speeds, sa uh, safer road users, and post-crash care. So coming back to our, our six principles and going to go into a little bit more detail uh, here with them. Starting with zero fatalities or, or zero deaths and serious injuries. Um, just as a culture, we, we accept that it's going to be okay. Every time 
we speed, we pick up the phone, we, you know, uh, drive drowsy, we drive drunk. And so we need to change that attitude, that culture as, as a, a society and make it so that deaths and serious injuries are unacceptable. You know, that humans make mistakes here. As you see in this image here, this is a couple, uh, you know, mid twenties ish, probably that are darting across the street. Should, should they have been doing it? They're going out in front of a car. Like I said, I've made mistakes primarily in my youth, but I still do. You know, I've been that young uh, teenager, just fresh 16 years old, getting my driver's license and racing around town, seeing uh, there was a, I remember there was a humped crossing near where, uh, where I lived, uh, a railroad crossing. Uh, it, if you took it more than 40 miles an hour, you'd catch a little air in your car. So I remember driving my mom's 1991 Chevy Lumina about 50 miles an hour. And yeah, caught a little air. I was very fortunate, but I make mistakes. You know, we all do. We learn from that. I've slowed down as I've gotten older and realized that, hey, I've, I was lucky there. I shouldn't have been doing that. So <clears throat> humans are vulnerable. You know, this is a uh, just a, a, a depiction showing here that as crash kinetic energy goes up, so does the risk and probability of a fatality there. So if you have just, you know, slower speeds, um, you know, a lot less kinetic energy involved here, you're, you're maybe likely going to get a serious injury. Uh, but it, as your speed increases, your mass goes up, and everything, so does your risk of a fatality. Um, so that's just a key concept that humans are vulnerable. You know, it's pretty easy to break a bone. It's pretty easy to uh, to end a life as well. That responsibility is shared. As I said, it's not just the planners, designers, policymakers um, that are in this audience right now, but it's also the, those vehicle manufacturers, law enforcement personnel. They need to be out there teaching people the hard way to follow the rules. That post-crash uh, personnel, you know, they're out there trying to clean up after a crash has occurred but they too have some responsibility not to shine their, their lights, for instance, into the eyes of oncoming traffic, possibly causing uh, other uh, secondary crashes. You know, they have that responsibility not to just to park their cars anywhere. The systems users, those people, that's the John Q public that's driving their car. It's all of you that drove there today. It's me coming into the office here in Ames. Um, we all have that responsibility to be good, responsible drivers, to, res to drive at, at um, appropriate speeds, to abide by the rules and the laws. So we've got that shared responsibility. So also with safe systems, it's to be proactive. You know, rather than waiting for those hot spots to occur, wait, rather than waiting for a fatality to occur, it's identifying those risks and trying to mitigate them. Hey, you know what, this is, uh, there's there's a uh, uh, a curve perhaps uh, I'm thinking of a curve here in in Ames if anybody's familiar with it 13th Street goes under a railroad viaduct there the railroad is always dripping water you know and it's on a curve there so it's it's winter time so when you identify some risks that you know what that there might be some possibility of icing occur so let's put some signs there let's fix that leak let's do something like that or at least um, mitigate those risks as best we can. So you try to identify those high risk areas um, and do what you can. And finally, redundancy is crucial. You have the thought with safe systems is by having these multiple layers, and I've got a great graphic and a few slides that shows this, but by having these multiple layers, these multiple strategies, these safer roads, uh, the safe vehicle, safe speeds, the safer road users, by having all of them, hopefully one of those is, is going to succeed and prevent that fatality. So now to go into those elements there. Again, these are them here, the safe road, safe road users, safer vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care. Those safe road users, you know, it's not just the drivers. As you can see here, it's those pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, it's our transit uh, um, users and transit operators. It's also, you know, people in wheelchairs, people on the scooters, people on the e-bikes, things like that. Um, they need to be cognizant of their surroundings, not have their head down in their phone as they walk out into a crosswalk. They need to be abiding by the rules and the laws of the, of the road. 
Don't be mm -hmm. jaywalking, you know, wait for that green. I've got a story here where um, my son was, uh, he was 13 and 14. He was coming home from Ames High uh, near North Grand Mall, uh, crossing Grand Avenue, if anybody's familiar with, uh, with um, Grand and 24th uh, near North Grand Mall here in Ames. Um, this was September of 2018 was the first time. And he was not exactly, the, didn't make the wisest decision there. He started crossing when the ped countdown timer was around 10. He got about three quarters of the way across the intersection. And long story short, very fortunately, um, he is okay. Uh, but uh, it turned the northbound traffic got a green light and he got that red and he wasn't all the way across a vehicle. He was shadowed by a, a large truck in a vehicle in the outside lane, saw the green light and they gave it the gas and they went. He got a little bumped and bruised a couple scrapes, but he was fortunately okay. Um, he learned, he learned his lesson um, to, to keep his wits about him. Uh, and unfortunately though, a year later, same intersection, 2019, uh, he was crossing at that same intersection and he, this time he waited, got the green, then he started walking. So that way he, you know, and, but unfortunately um, another driver was turning left and they were waiting for their gap and they made a mistake. They weren't paying attention. They didn't look to see if the crosswalk was, was clear and they turned left they hit my son again. So two years in a row, September each year. Um, fortunately, again, my son was okay. But uh, it's a safe road users. They need to be aware of their surroundings. Look at where they're going. So that's my little story here, my little soapbox. Um, safe road users need to not be dry, driving distracted or, or impaired. So put the phone down. You know what? Hey, you've had a drink. It's, it's the holiday season. I was just at a couple holiday parties this weekend. And I saw on more than one occasion where people did the responsible thing. They gave their spouse or whoever they came with, gave them the keys to the car, said, you know what? Hey, do you mind being the DD? You know, those are, those are, that's the responsible thing to do. Follow in those rules there. Again, my son, he should have waited that first time and, and start, instead of crossing when there was only 10 seconds left um, and act within the limits of the road design. What we mean by that is, you know, if, if that, that curve, if it's signed at thir with an adv advisory speed limit of 35 miles an hour, drive that 35 miles an hour. Don't say here, hold my, hold my phone or hold my beer and watch this and uh, see how fast you can take it. You know, mm -hmm. we need to um, act responsibly and drive within the limits of the roadway there. Mm -hmm. Safer vehicles. You know, this is a bit on the manufacturers. They've been coming out with a lot of features. So many of you probably have some of these features in your in your vehicles today. The, uh, some active uh, safety features, an example, lane departure warnings. It's a little buzz that goes off, or the little light that goes off and says, hey, you're, you're kind of drifting here. Um, the autonomous emergency braking, that's another thing out there. It's, these are great safety measures that the manufacturers are implementing. Um, we also have the passive stuff like the uh, seat belts, airbags. Those have been around for years, but having these multiple layers, as you can see, we're starting to stack multiple layers, um, hopefully in, with the intent of preventing a fatality or serious injury here. So also here we've got uh, some more with... Um, uh, vehicles, they can also now, some of them can start detecting uh, when bicycles or pedestrians are present. You know, had the driver that hit my son um, had that in their vehicle, maybe they might not have hit my son. I don't know. Uh, but it adds uh, another layer, you know, vehicle size and design. You know, over the years, vehicles have gotten larger. They've gotten bigger. Bumper heights have gone up. As the bumper heights go up, instead of in a pedestrian versus vehicle, crash instead of taking out the kneecaps now you're taking out hips you take you know uh, in young children you're hitting them in the rib cage you know this is the higher up you go the more likely of a serious injury or a fatality here um, connected autonomous vehicles those are those are coming they've got a lot of features there as well um, so to help alert a driver alert drivers safe speeds you know we've i Personally, I believe that uh, that we have kind of created some of the speed epidemic that we have out there because how fast did many of you drive today? If the speed limit says 55, 
most of you might think, hey, I can go 60, 62. And why is that? Because we've been trained that way. Law enforcement has not been jerks. They have not gone out there and ticket somebody at 56 miles an hour. So in a way, we've kind of created this, this epidemic of speeding that we've gotten by allowing some margin of error. And people mm -hmm. now expect it. Um, but if we can get those speeds down, that reduces that kinetic energy. And that then reduces the probability and likelihood of, of uh, fatalities there. Mm -hmm. So just to show some examples here of what can happen here. So if a, um, these are for pedestrians. So if a pedestrian is hit by a vehicle traveling at 23 miles per hour, you get a 10% chance of, of a fatality. But now if that same pedestrian was hit by a vehicle going 58 miles an hour, there's 90% chance of death there. So um, you can see there, it's about 50-50 at, at 40 miles an hour there. So it's, you know, as speed goes up, so does the likelihood of uh, fatalities. And this is just a quick depiction of showing that. Um, so this uh, different curves for an auto hitting a pedestrian, auto hitting fixed objects, as the speed increases and you impact some of these things here, so is your risk of fatalities. So, you know, for instance, in the auto hits an auto in a head on, you know, that's at 50 miles an hour. You know, you're maybe probably about, I'd say, 75% uh, likelihood of fatality there because two vehicles going 50 miles an hour, it's the same as that one vehicle going 100 miles an hour into a dead stop, into a wall. And as you can imagine, that's probably gonna be pretty violent. So how do we uh, control speed? You know, there's law enforcement, they can go out there and teach people the hard way by uh, giving them some tickets to the policeman's ball, but we can also, with engineering strategies. Um, as the image on the left here shows, uh, typical signalized intersection in an urban area, um, you know, it's a straight line be across that intersection there. So as signals get timed for progression and, and connected uh, with adjacent signals there, you get those platooning of vehicles. And that's great for operations because your speeds start going up, but it's horrible for safety because your speeds go up. So you can do something like here with the roundabout where, you know, it's going to slow down those vehicles. Uh, roundabouts are typically designed for 20 to 25 mile an hour circulating speed there. So it forces the driver to slow down. Um, in addition to eliminating those uh, high uh, impact uh, collision types, T-bone collisions, things like that, where you have a high likelihood of uh, fatalities there. So little graphics here. So as you can see, um, you know, instead of having that straight line, you, you force it to go around the, the center island. So our safer roads, um, they're designed, you know, to uh, and operated to prevent crashes and keep those impacts at tolerable levels. So um, things like, we're gonna go through a couple examples here. We can uh, separate our users uh, in space. So as you see here, the image on the left, we've got bicyclists on a separated bike lane from the, the motor vehicle traffic to the left of the, the young lady riding the bike. Um, we can also separate our users in time. So it's things, practices such as uh, leading pedestrian interval. That's that all red phase and allowing the pedestrians to have their green so that way they can get out into that crosswalk and be more visible to the vehicles that are waiting for their green to go. So hopefully they don't hit the pedestrians. Um, and, you know, we can also just increase awareness, things like signing, as you can see here on the image on the right, or just painting the uh, the curbs yellow, just to raise awareness that, hey, this is a, uh, for vehicle operators, they're crossing a, a crosswalk here and there could be pedestrians. They need to be looking for that. So those are some ways we can make our roads safer. Uh, we can also manage our speeds with uh, speed feedback trailers. Those are, are great um, at reducing speeds. It's a little bit of the public shaming game, you know, also, you get the teenagers that may say, hey, let's see how high of a score I can get. But that's where the law enforcement needs to come in there and teach them the, the hard way. Um, problem with those speed feedback trailers is they're typically, you know, it'll slow traffic down for a little bit. Um, but after, you know, a block or two or a half mile, sometimes, you know, oftentimes speeds do pick back up. So, um, but if you've got a crosswalk, a school crossing, something like that, or 
uh, it might be good to put out there where, all right, hey, we can at least slow down traffic for these few blocks. Um, we can also manipulate uh, the masses with um, our signal timing and coordination, things like that. Uh, or as uh, the image on the right here, manipulating those crash angles with a roundabout, instead of having those T-bone crashes, um, you now have more uh, sideswipe crashes, which are typically less severe. So um, when we're looking at safer roads, we're not just talking about the design and construction, but it's also the maintenance and operation of those. Um, you know, design that can be things such as having a roundabout, uh, or uh, but maintenance uh, that can be uh, um, making sure you've got good work zones. Same thing with with construction. You know, those are those are planned events that we need that we can have out there. Having good work zones, safer work zones. Make sure we're communicating to our drivers where and what we want them to do. Operations. Um, again, we can start manipulating <laughs> things with uh, with signals and timing, um, but also surveillance. We can get alerts when there's crashes uh, early on with uh, with our um, with cameras, and then that can also um, speed up our um, uh, post crash care, which is coming in here. I heard a little tink was that a, something in the chat hopefully not okay so our post crash care this is also vital it's it's the fifth um element here in the safe systems and you know that's our our first responders they need to have that training so like i said before they're not shining their eyes into uh oncoming traffic um it, crash investigation find you that's that can be uh, improved by using a lot of technology to come out there very quickly, map uh, using uh, LIDAR or something like that. They can map crashes and get all the data they need. Uh, whereas, you know, in the old days, you would have brought out a total station and you would have had cops out there surveying uh, and uh, mapping out everything. So it's, uh, you can get in there now with drones and you can map everything out very quickly. Um, and also our justice system. You know, we need the the justice system to hold people accountable there, um, and not just be a you know a, a rubber stamp or just a, a slap on the wrist there. So I talked about all these layers, and I said I mentioned earlier that we have I had a graphic, and this is it. So it's a Swiss cheese sort of a model, um, where we have these five different redundant layers of safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post crash care with the hope that hopefully one of those will, one or more will uh, take effect and prevent a, a fatality when a crash occurs. Because remember, one of the principles is people are gonna make mistakes, crashes are going to occur. But now if we have these five elements here, it takes all five of those to align as the image on the right. You know, it's kind of like planets aligning and everything for a fatality to occur. So it makes it much less likelihood or it makes the likelihood much less for a fatality to occur. I wanna go through just a couple quick case studies here. So this is uh, Carmel, Indiana, roundabout capital of the United States. Um, in 1997, their city council um, said, you know what, hey, we've, we've had enough with our fatalities at our intersections, and they started converting um, intersections to roundabouts. They've converted over 125 of them. Um, and I, I uh, earlier, I said roundabouts are good for a couple reasons. The impact angle, it changes that. It also slows speed down. So those two things right there, you're going to be um, looking at reducing fatalities with. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, it's a great little uh, um, intervention there. Queens Boulevard in New York, uh, they uh, had a massive amount of pavement out there, just multiple lanes, bike lanes, sharing with the uh, the road. Uh, the vehicle traffic and it was parking. I want to say it was about uh, seven uh, lanes wide. And what they did was they reduced it. They separated the uh, bicycle users in space by having a uh, separated bike lane with a uh, pedestrian refuge uh, island there in the middle, as you see. Uh, having that pedestrian refuge island uh, gave the pedestrians crossing the motor vehicle lanes a spot to stop because it's such a massive pavement. Um, 
also raise the conspicuity of those pedestrian islands with uh, with signing mm -hmm. and as you can see here next to the pedestrian that concrete uh, wall right next to right next to her. Um, so this work to slow down the speeds, raise awareness, separate the the pedestrians in time and space, um, and it made it a much safer road there for all different modes of travel. Mm -hmm. So as I'm coming into the home stretch here. Um, on the left, you see the traditional approach and how we used to look at crashes. It was, hey, let's pr try to prevent crashes. But now with safe, sy safe systems, it is, let's prevent those deaths and serious injuries. We know crashes are going to occur. So rather than just, hey, we need to change behavior, let's design and accommodate that behavior. We know people are gonna make mistakes, but we can put in some things into our designs that can help, um, reduce that system kinetic energy instead of getting out there and using law enforcement to control the speed and being quite frankly the jerks you know hey let's let's make people just slow down by having some uh, some uh, things designed into the roadway to slow them down um and instead of just saying you know what it was the driver's fault they shouldn't have been drinking you know what hey yeah they, you're right they shouldn't have been drinking but we can do we can do things to try and um accommodate those mistakes and make crashes uh, be less severe when they do occur. So rather than being reactive, let's be proactive. So those are that's how we're, we're going from that traditional approach to a safe system approach there. So, um, you know, the, the hope is that by implementing safe system approach, you know, we can, uh, that we all have a role in, we can improve uh, the situation on our roadways and reduce fatalities with this. I'll take any questions anybody has. Oh, cool. So, Paul, um, does your son drive now? or is <laughs> My son is actually over in Mount Vernon at Cornell College. I have to pick him up in the height of the snow tomorrow. So, yeah, <laughs> he is. Yeah, so he avoids that intersection. Oh, yes, he does. He does. Yeah. I, I told him, I said, uh, you've been hit at the same intersection twice. Uh, find a different way home, please. <laughs> I did not want third times the charm, you know. So, and I'm not trying to pick on names. I'm just sharing a, a personal story. So. Paul, do you have any examples of what you showed for those intersections where, where urban, a lot of the people in this group are, have some more rural concerns? Do you have any examples for how to create safer intersections in a more rural environment? Um, well, roundabouts are are something you can do in a rural environment. Um, Minnesota has uh, started a practice of putting it to raise awareness in rural areas. You know, oftentimes, you know, you've got great distances between cities and you get that tunnel vision going. You're driving 62 miles an hour, two lane little road, and you're just going. Um, but when you come into a city, hey, wait a minute, all of a sudden there's there's homes start popping up and the speed goes 55 to 35 real quick. So what Minnesota has done was for those first couple intersections, right as you're getting into the city limits, they, in some of their towns, they've started putting in roundabouts because it gives visual cues as well as as, as physical cues to slow down. You're, you're having to drive around that, that central island there. Um, hey, there's... A central island in the road so you get that visual cue i'm coming into a different environment i'm leaving the corn and soybeans and oh it wakes you up out of that tunnel vision hey there's homes over here oh little timmy's wanting to cross the street here i need to be careful of that so so that's something in a, in a rural environment but it's that rural in, transition into uh into a uh you know a small city or a small urban area or an urban area um but for the you know uh, two lane, two lane, you know, cornfield on all four corners, you know, things such as, as, you know, larger right away or, or paying farmers not to, not to, not to farm all the way up to the right away line. Because as we all know, we've, we've, we drive around Iowa, you get those tunnels, quite literally tunnels when you got six, eight foot corn stalks on either side. Um, but mowing, keeping those back to enhance the visibility at those rural isolated intersections there. Um, you know, uh, that that's something good. Um, so there's just a couple couple things off the top of my head, um, but I can certainly dig around and, and 
um, and uh, send you some more information on some other ideas and practices. Oh, I'm Paul, this is David Resnick from the Duke City Council. I'm just going to throw us a few things at you and ask for your comments, please. Um, I'm glad you talked about biker, uh, bike, bicyclists and pedestrians. You know, we don't really have education for bicyclists and even pedestrians on, on traffic, uh, except we, we expect families to talk to them about it, uh, but we don't have any system for bikes and there are more of them. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm just saying that in the view, it's 10 minutes to anywhere if you're driving, but the drivers are still annoyed if bikers are slowing them down. So, um, so we, we need to build some safer structures into our roads to help them. Um, and uh, stop signs uh, in Idaho just means yield to bicyclists. And, and that's the reality. If, you're, if you ride a bike like I do, I'm not gonna stop and get off, you know, put my feet on the ground every time I get to a stop sign, but I do yield. Uh, and so maybe we could talk about that uh, becoming a reality. And finally, when I was driving around Ireland for a week, I noticed that their, um, their speed limits were actually limits. Nobody actually drove the limit. Where around here, it's the minimum. If it says 55, that means minimum to Iowa and almost anywhere. So I'd love your comments on any of those, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank, thanks, Dave, uh, David, I believe you said so. Um, <clears throat> The Idaho stops, that is something that's that's come along in the last year or two. Idaho did, uh, for those not in, in the room not aware, Idaho passed a, a law, I think they were one of the first, if not the first in the country, that makes it now legal for, I'm, I'm going off memory here, bicyclists to yield at a red traffic signal and at a stop sign, they can just go right through. Um, so they've they've downgraded what the what the bicyclists uh, are required to do there. So um, is that a good practice, bad practice? I think it's you know it's great for the bicyclists because they don't have to uh, slow down as much or, or come to a complete stop and then get lose all of their momentum. Um, you know, but uh, it, it's something to me that it's uh, I want to see some more data and find out. Okay. Is it truly safe? You know, that's that's Idaho, uh, largely a rural state. I was I was just there last month, in fact, and so I got to see some of that firsthand. Um, but uh, you know, I I think you know you know what we, I think it, it might have some uses. I think uh, there might be some appropriate situations where that might be okay. Uh, am I ready to state uh, on the behalf of Federal Highway that hey, go for it? No, not really. But it's something that um, you know I think. Uh, we are looking at, I am personally looking at, and there are some others in, in uh, the Office of Safety that are looking at, um, and we're watching that uh, keenly there. So that's that's my comments on the Idaho stop, but um, your, your, your comments about Ireland, hmm, I, I like that culture there. That's a different culture. And we need to spread the message here, uh, not just to everybody in this room, but to our friends, our neighbors, our children, our parents. Um, and change John Q. Public's uh, ideology and culture that you're right, 55 is the minimum. Um, it shouldn't be, 55 should be that maximum. Uh, a, you know, a lot of uh, crashes occur when there's a speed differential. You get somebody who views 55 as a uh, minimum and somebody who views it as a maximum. And now you got a 62 and a 52, that 10 mile an hour speed differential and somebody, yeah, that's when crashes can occur. So we got to work on changing that culture. Um, it takes time. It takes a effort by everyone. Uh, and so that's why I'm here talking with all of you. You know, I think hopefully I am preaching to the choir in this room, uh, but also hopefully this inspires some of you to go home and tell your friends, your neighbors, your children, and say, hey, I just heard about this guy, <laughs> you know, in Ames, Iowa, his son got hit twice, same intersection, a year apart, you know, uh, please be careful out there, wear a helmet. You know, my son is now a advocate for helmet use, um, and first time he wasn't wearing his helmet, the second time he was, so that's, hopefully that gives you a little bit of what you were looking for there, David. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Anybody else in the room? Something we're implementing is a destination lighting for rural intersections, gravel roads, just to give you a heads up that there's a T intersection or something coming. And a couple that's, areas, that's... a couple areas we put up the uh, solar stop lights or stop signs with the flashing lights, mm -hmm. and those really make a difference. I think let you know yeah. there's a cross road there. So. Yeah, I was actually uh, just last week. I was uh, I was at a uh, training on lighting design. Uh, actually, uh, Federal Highway. This is uh, in preparation for the next round of uh, Everyday Counts. Uh, we uh, kind of unprecedented. They uh, put twenty of us through a lot of uh, a week long lighting training um, on lighting design, lighting operations, uh, and learned a lot of a lot of great things there it was at uh, virginia tech uh they have a smart road corridor there where they were able to set up uh different uh street lights and show us just the effects just just how little things little tweaks to lighting design uh can have great impact on the visibility of um the road things along the road uh you know vehicles in front of you be it pedestrians deer whatever um and so it was very interesting so uh, be looking for a little bit more to to come from Federal Highway on on lighting in the in the um, the future here. I would say. Now, one more comment. We uh, just finished a flat street uh, project in Covid, and the street lighting is less than adequate. I feel it, there's what you want to call it LED lighting. They're really intense, bright. So as you're driving, I actually put my wind my visor down. Because it's like the light hits you in the eyes real bright, and then it gets dark right after you leave. And you get this back and forth, and it makes it hard to see pedestrians. I just feel there's it needs to have more shielding on it, or more lights, or it's not like the old, you know, the old street lights where everything had a nice glow to it. It's just awkward. I mean, you see dark and light going down the whole street when you look down at it. It's just a lot of shadows and stuff where you don't see pedestrians. I don't know if there's any way to fix that or. I mean, it's it's a new thing that's coming, and I, I feel it's going the wrong way. It doesn't; it's just not comfortable driving through it. I'm not uh, familiar with that particular corridor, but but certainly, you know, lighting is something that it's got. There's a lot of knobs and dials, uh, just to, for an analogy there, that they can tweak and change a lot of different things, and and hopefully take care of some of that glare, make it a little bit easier. Because yeah, you certainly don't want to be um, causing more problems than than you're you're solving by having uh, lighting out there. Uh, lighting has a lot of great benefits, um, but it, you know it's. Yeah, you don't want to be causing issues with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions for Paul? Thank you, Paul, for joining us today. No problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Stuart Anderson. He's the Director of Planning, Programming, um, and Modal Division at the Iowa Department of Transportation. Stu graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree yep. in Civil Engineering from Iowa State University in 1991 and has worked at the Iowa DOT since graduation. Stu is the Director of Transportation Development Division. He's responsible for multimodal transportation planning, programming, and project development. So thank you very much, Stu, for joining us today. And we look forward to you. Come on, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, as always, for inviting me to participate in this event. I always love uh, making the trip up here. I'm sad to miss a couple uh, trips in person over the last several years. Uh, so very happy to be here again in person. And I especially always love the drive up here uh, from the Des Moines area. It's nice to see the latest big project that's gotten wrapped up uh, today. I was excited to drive through the Swiss Valley Interchange uh, for the first time, see that fully complete. I know that was a big priority for the commission for quite a few years. Nice to see that uh, that wrapped up. Um, thanks very much for uh, the very uh, kind welcoming comments from uh, the mayors and, and everyone. Uh, of course, uh, I'm just one small part of a big DOT team. Uh, thanks to Sam Shea for being your district transportation planner uh, up in the area. Uh, we have a lot of great folks at the district office and, and in Ames that uh, are very committed to transportation. I think one of the great things about, about Iowa is the strong partnership we have. Uh, really happy with the partnership we have with DOT with cities and counties and RPAs and MPOs in the state. I think that really 
pays dividends and, and I could list a lot of examples. I think uh, talking about the implementation of the infrastructure bill is, is another one of those examples. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, also give you a very brief update on our five-year program that the commissioner approved last June and we'll uh, be working on here soon for next year. Uh, some other transportation investments and then close with a few slides about a new all systems overweight permit that uh, is probably mostly of interest to county folks, but uh, it, it, we're getting a lot of questions about that. So I thought I'd include some slides on that. Uh, before I jump into the slides, I do wanna uh, follow up on Paul's excellent presentation about safety. Um, as of yesterday, we have 333 fatalities in the state of Iowa, which uh, although that's slightly uh, better than last year, last year was, was a peak year. Uh, so we, we have a lot of work to do in, in the state and, and across the country. Uh, I drive between uh, my home in the Des Moines area in Ames every day. And uh, I would say at least once a day, I see some person texting on their cell phone as I drive. Uh, so that distracted driving is crazy. And of our fatalities in Iowa, about half uh, of fatalities are unbelted uh, drivers or passengers. Uh, Iowa has a 93% participation rate for wearing belts, which is actually really good. Um, so if we could just get closer to 100, uh, we could cut our fatalities in half. So um, I know that's a real priority for the commission and, uh, and the department. So I appreciate you having Paul speak uh, about that. All right, infrastructure bill. Uh, last year in December, we were uh, just about a month into uh, having an infrastructure bill passed, which uh, as we know, that was a pretty momentous bill and the amount of funding it provided for all sorts of infrastructure in the country. Uh, from the highway perspective, uh, the big thing the infrastructure uh, bill did is it provided a new authorization. So it gave five more years of, of dedicated funding for surface transportation, so highways and public transit. So, uh, and it did so at increased levels. On the highway system, about a 30% increase over the life of the bill and on public transit, about a 35% increase. Um, starts out a little lower in first year, but then grows each year of the, of the five years of the infrastructure bill. Of course, also provided funding for uh, airports, um, uh, our waterway system, great investments in the waterway system uh, that have been missed uh, for, for many years, um, and all other sorts of infrastructure, rural water, broadband, wastewater systems. Um, so while that passed a year ago, November, uh, we knew we still had a lot of work to do uh, because there are a lot of new programs uh, that meant there needed to be a lot of discussions. Again, this goes to the partnership between DOT, cities, counties, RPAs, and MPOs. We had, a, we had to really get to work to figure out how to allocate these funds. And, and that actually took, took quite a bit of work to get through that process. I'll talk about that in more detail as I focus most of my comments on the highway side, but. Here's just some examples of, of uh, infrastructure bill funding for some non-highway modes. Um, on the aviation side, as I mentioned, there's increased formula funding plus some new discretionary programs. Uh, for example, there's a new airport uh, terminal program. Uh, the first year of that uh, grants went to several Iowa airports, including Des Moines, uh, the Eastern Iowa Airport, Cedar Rapids, and Iowa City. Um, public transit, I mentioned 35% on average increase in formula funding. Uh, also, Iowa did really well in some discretionary grant opportunities. Uh, the state of Iowa, uh, working in partnership with our public transit agency, submits uh, applications for discretionary funding on behalf of them. Uh, for bus replacement, we got a $12 million award for vehicle replacement. Last year, we didn't get any. Normally, we've been getting about $5 million, so this was a really nice award this year. And then a new low and no emission discretionary uh, bus program, or relatively new. Uh, but at much higher levels, uh, we submitted a grant and got uh, about $16 million. That was what we asked for. So um, nice award for getting some electric buses in uh, the system, more focused in uh, regional transit systems. On the rail side, uh, of course, there's really no formula funding for rail, although we get some for rail crossing improvements. Um, there also was funding uh, that continued in the infrastructure bill for railroads to apply through discretionary programs. And, Shortline railroads in Iowa have done really well with a program called the Chrissy Pro Program. Um, so uh, Iowa Northern Railway uh, here up in uh, north, north oh, central Iowa got a $7 million grant uh, to rebuild and take some rail. And then we'll talk more about trail funding here in a second. Oh. 
So uh, here's, here's the process we went through to implement the infrastructure bill. Um, definitely, I'm not going to walk through this, but you can see it started with the bill passage November of last year and, and culminated in July. It took up through July uh, to, uh, one, get guidance from the federal government on some of these new programs about how funds can be used. Um, but then also working again with all the stakeholders in Iowa to identify how to allocate these programs between DOT, uh, city, county, RPA, and MPO. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about SWAP in, in a bit here, but SWAP was a major uh, discussion item because with increased federal funding that uh, unfortunately had an impact of significantly reducing our ability to, to SWAP funds because with more federal funds, there's more state match we need to provide at the DOT. So that limits the state funds we can swap out uh, like we have in the last four or five years. So a lot of work uh, in Iowa. Um, Iowa code allows the Iowa DOT director um, to make decisions on how federal funds are allocated. But for, for many decades and many directors, uh, the department has always taken the perspective that the Transportation Commission is actually the best body to make that decision since they're uh, representing the entire state and, and they're more, more of a, a broad party. So uh, part of this process was working with the commission, sharing them recommendations, what the results of input were, and ultimately in July is when they voted on approving the allocation processes for these federal funds. So here's the list of highway programs. I'm not gonna walk through these. You can see there's quite a few programs uh, that we had to digest and uh, develop recommendations. Most of them were existing programs. Uh, the infrastructure bill just reauthorized a lot of the existing programs, but at higher funding levels. But then there were some new programs, uh, basically those at the bottom. Um, the biggest and most important to the state of Iowa is a new bridge formula program, which Iowa fared very well in getting that formula. Of course, we fared well because we have a lot of poor bridges in the state, particularly on the county system. So kind of good news, bad news there. Um, but almost $90 million of, of formula bridge funding uh, to the state. So as a new program, we had to figure out how does that fit in with the allocation of other programs like the Service Transportation Block Grant, which is the most significant program for funding at the local level. So here's a list of the um, items that, again, all stakeholders had to digest and make some recommendations on how they should be allocated and ultimately make recommendations to the commission. I have a slide for, I think, each of these. Um, and I'm not, not gonna spend a lot of time on most of them. There's a lot of information on these slides. It's included mostly for reference. You can uh, have access to this presentation and use that uh, as you see fit to learn more about it. But uh, I'll just kind of hit the highlights of the important uh, programs or the changes. So um, the, the most impactful discussion as it related to allocation of funds at the local level was the allocation of the service transportation block grant of this new bridge program. So overall, there's kind of a, a broader allocation um, between DOT and local governments that's been around for many decades. So within that broader framework, then we look at each individual program to balance how those are allocated. So with that significant new bridge program, really that's where most of the discussion uh, focused on is how do we allocate these two between state and, and local governments. Um, and that took, yeah, several, several meetings to come to some consensus on that. So uh, it's actually surprisingly complicated, the process that we went through, and it's really hard to explain. You can see there's a lot of bullets and sub-bullets on here. I'm not gonna walk through that. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, there was uh, an allocation of service transportation block grant that generally follows the same allocation process as we had before the infrastructure bill with just some tweaks. Um, how this uh, ended up is in the first year of this uh, of the infrastructure bill, uh, the targets to MPOs and RPAs are about 20% higher for the service transportation block grant than they were uh, uh, before uh, the infrastructure bill. So about 20% growth, that percentage grows each year. So then again, each RPA and MPO programs those funds. Um, I'm gonna, give my little talk about swap on this slide. I don't have a dedicated swap slide. Uh, as I mentioned, we were severely constrained in how much we can swap with the increased federal funding. So that was another focus item of discussion is how do we 
decide which projects to continue to take advantage of SWAP. And I, I commend the counties in Iowa, they came to the table right away and said, um, let's have our projects be federal aid. They're relatively straightforward projects, um, so there's less complexity to them. Uh, they're also getting very well versed in administering federal aid projects. Uh, so that helped. Uh, we also determined that the MPOs really um, probably need to use federal aid for those projects. Um, the area that everyone agreed we should continue to focus on receiving SWAP are um, smaller cities in Iowa. And by smaller cities, I'm saying cities below 50,000 population. So basically every city in an RPA that has program funds, those will continue to be SWAP projects. We really felt cities in that area, you know, up to 50,000 population, really would benefit most from having that easier project development process. So, um, so that's what the new SWAP policy looks like that um, uh, really kind of takes effects with, with generally with projects being let beginning in January of this year. Uh, we also retained some money, SWAP money to help with some match funds for um, some county projects, particularly on the bridge side. And uh, we, uh, we'll talk about highway safety funds. Uh, we, uh, some highway safety month funds for locals will also be swap projects to, uh, again, make those easier to use. So the bridge formula program, um, much less uh, complexity in how they're allocated, although uh, it seems uh, uh, very specific, we allocated it down to the dollar, uh, how those bridge uh, funds, uh, formula funds are allocated. Um, Again, that was really a calculation to balance the fund allocation between DOT and local governments. So this is something we'll be addressing every year and balancing that again to maintain that, that, that balance. So again, most of that funding is allocated by formula to counties, and then there's a city bridge fund uh, for how those will be made available. We, uh, we have benefited in Iowa um, because um, uh, even before the infrastructure bill, Congress was appropriating some additional bridge funding uh, every year to states. Um, so that was always a, a nice little bump that was, uh, wasn't always planned for, but uh, we ended up receiving. Uh, so we were really pleased last year with the infrastructure bill. Uh, we assumed with a new dedicated bridge program, we wouldn't get that little extra bump in the appropriation bill, uh, but we did. Uh, Congress went beyond the infrastructure bill on the bridge side and allocated about $40 million um, for bridges. So that went into the discussion as well on how to allocate those funds. Uh, Highway Safety Improvement Program, uh, before the infrastructure bill, uh, we would allocate $2 million a year for a county Highway Safety Improvement Program um, uh, grant program where counties could apply for safety projects. Uh, with some additional funding in the infrastructure bill, the decision was made to increase that to a $5 million annual grant program and it opened it up to cities as well. So we now have a, a, a grant program that's for all cities and counties dedicated for safety. And again, those will be, will be swap funds uh, to make those easier to administer. Um, some freight funding, uh, we did, we have, that's a program that did uh, exist before the infrastructure bill and continues uh, in Iowa. We set aside a portion of that for multimodal and rail freight projects. Uh, the commission decided to continue doing that as well uh, through a program we call the LIFTS program, Linking Iowa's Freight Transportation System. Um, Transportation Alternatives Program, this is um, funding that is allocated to each MPO and RPA uh, and some stays at the state level. This is primarily used for trail projects in Iowa. It used to be called the Transportation Enhancement Program. Uh, this program saw by far the largest increase of any federal program in the infrastructure bill on the highway side. So a lot of discussion went into how to allocate those funds. We, um, uh, uh, when it was the enhancement program, uh, we actually kept uh, several million dollars at the state level for larger state, uh, sig statewide significant trail projects. But when that program uh, actually got cut uh, in an authorization bill, um, uh, and turned into the Transportation Alternatives Program. We significantly scaled back the state allocation so that RPAs and MPOs wouldn't be impacted by that cut. So they still would get the same amount of, of funding for trails at the regional metro level. But with a large increase in, uh, in Alternatives Program funding, 
uh, actually were able to more than double the allocation to uh, MPOs and RPAs. I think it's about 130, 140% increase um, and still increase uh, the state program. So we're actually gonna have a $5 million annual application program for projects of statewide significance. So we can put real significant chunks of money in these larger trail projects or more costly trail projects. Uh, we're still figuring out the details of that. Hopefully in the next uh, uh, couple months here, we'll be announcing our first round of funding uh, applications for that statewide program. Uh, there's just a flow chart for that. Uh, CMAC funding, uh, we set aside some of that for uh, Iowa's Clean Entertainment Program. That continues at the same level. Uh, we also set aside $3 million a year for bus replacement in Iowa, and that continues at the same level. So there is a new carbon reduction program. Uh, so this is formula funding to states for investing in projects that reduce carbon emissions. So uh, we certainly expect uh, this money will go to uh, support transit projects, maybe bike ped projects maybe even some uh, innovative materials and uh, pavements that uh, have a less of a carbon life cycle. Um, this, uh, this program, uh, again, with a lot of the opportunity to make improvements in this area, in the metro areas, uh, the decision was made to allocate some of these funds to each of Iowa's MPOs. So I think, uh, I think DMATS gets 200,000 or so uh, per year to program. Uh, we have an email coming out here in the next day or so that will provide some more uh, information on um, how to allocate those. There's been some federal webinars on that. Um, so we're all learning a little bit about how to use these funds um, with the infrastructure bill. So uh, electric vehicle infrastructure funds. Um, so this is a new, new, another new program. Iowa gets uh, about 50 million over the life of the bill, about 10 million per year to install uh, uh, DC fast charging uh, uh, infrastructure um, along corridors. Um, the guidance uh, requires that initially you fully build out your initial uh, designated alternative fuel corridors for electric vehicles, which was a system that existed before the infrastructure bill and before this program. Uh, it was primarily a system used for doing signage along um, uh, corridors. Uh, in Iowa, our system before the infrastructure bill was basically the interstate system, uh, 29, 80, 380, and, and uh, 35. And so um, now, now there's a new funding program tied to that. We need to build out those corridors uh, to have a charging site at minimum standards at least every 50 miles. And then we can start building off of that corridor. Uh, we did have kind of a really short window, states did, to expand their network. Um, we didn't take advantage of that primarily because we wanted to maximize our flexibility because once you fully build out your initial system, then you can go anywhere you want. Um, certainly, I know uh, it was acknowledged up front that Dubuque uh, not being on any of those interstate corridors is not eligible for these funds right away. Um, we expect uh, the first two years of funding will allow us to go fully build out on the interstate. And in our first round, which we hope to roll out here this spring, uh, we have two years of funding. So uh, we think uh, round two and beyond, we'll be able to get off of the interstate system. And certainly I think the 151 corridor will be a priority because that's a designated corridor in Wisconsin, uh, but probably other major commercial network corridors like 20 and 30, uh, 61 as well. So um, much more opportunities to come with that program um, after this first round. A couple of federal funding status uh, update slides. Uh, um, the, the infrastructure is bill, bill is great because it gives us authorized funding levels, which is really important for um, doing long range plans and five year programs. But we still require annual appropriations to actually get at that money. Um, we've been operating under continuing resolution um, since the beginning of the federal fiscal year. Uh, it was set to expire last Friday, but they uh, extended it a week. Um, so it's now scheduled to expire this Friday. And there's, uh, I think, some real uh, optimism that that will get done. So we're hoping that by the end of this Friday, we'll have a full appropriation bill. And it looks like there may be some, uh, some increased uh, funding beyond infrastructure bill levels again, uh, like we've seen in recent years. So uh, more, more to come on that. 
Um, a couple slides about discretionary programs. Uh, we've talked about uh, raise and safe roads and streets for all programs already. Uh, the infrastructure bill increased formula programs, but it also significantly increased discretionary programs and created some new ones. And so um, you really have to take advantage of those programs to take full advantage of the infrastructure bill. And a lot of communities, uh, particularly Dubuque, have done really well in that. Um, uh, a lot of Eastern Iowa communities, uh, we talked about Clinton earlier uh, in the mayor's opening comments. Um, so a lot of opportunities there uh, to take advantage of. Uh, here's just a, a couple um, uh, programs. There was an initial solicitation for three programs, infra, mega, and rural. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each of those individually. Um, the infra uh, was announced in September. There were no Iowa awards in that. Um, we're still waiting for the other two programs. Uh, at the Iowa DOT, we submitted applications for those programs for the new Lansing uh, Mississippi River Bridge crossing uh, up on Iowa 9, also to help with the Iowa or Interstate 380, uh, Wright Brothers Boulevard interchange work in Cedar Rapids, and then some Super 2 work on US 63 in Tama County. Um, they're, they're, while they haven't announced this last round, they're going to announce the next round. Uh, of applications here in January, they expect. A raise, uh, which used to be Tiger, which used to be Build, uh, is now called Raise. That's been the program where communities in the country have done best. Uh, they are more community focused. Um, there were three awards in this last round in September. Of course, I uh, already talked about the uh, planning grant that uh, Dubuque area received. Uh, Muscatine also got some planning funding and Waterloo received a, a pretty big grant for some construction in their area. Uh, the next round of funding availability was uh, announced here in the last several weeks, and those applications are due February 28th. And then uh, there's also been discussion about the Safe Streets and Roads for All program. Uh, I gotta believe Iowa has uh, submitted the most applications for that program, which again, I think is a real dedication to the, the partnership we have at all levels in government and the commitment to safety. I think about every, county and, and uh, has been touched uh, with an application. So hopefully uh, in the next uh, few weeks, we'll hear awards for that. And there'll be a lot of uh, uh, planning uh, awards for doing some safety action plans in the state. I talked about the rail infrastructure program. Um, uh, there was a round uh, due December 1st, and I know several uh, short line railroads and regional railroads in Iowa submitted for that. So hopefully they're successful again. Then a railroad crossing elimination program. Uh, those applications were due October. Uh, I know several applications, including locally, were submitted for, for that funding as a new program. Stuck in part. Not the first one. Never to get in. Well, please mute your phone if you're listening online. Uh, getting to, uh, close to the end here, our five-year program. Uh, commission approved that last June. It fully implemented from the DOT perspective, uh, the infrastructure bill funding. Uh, the program went for a, from a $3.6 billion program to a $4.2 billion program uh, because of the uh, infrastructure bill. And idea. we've talked earlier about some of the inflation impacts. Uh, we certainly saw that with the last five-year program. About 40% of the increased revenue from the infrastructure bill actually went to cover uh, updated cost estimates. Um, so... You know, it's great we had the infrastructure bill, uh, kept projects moving, allowed us to add some more, but still uh, a little disheartening to see a good chunk of that just eaten up by, by cost inflation. Um, that's continuing, of course. Um, so our next five-year program, we don't have additional money, but we still have seen inflation. So uh, the next program will be more challenging for the commission. Um, they probably won't be able to add a lot of projects and may have to delay some projects as they, they work on that. Uh, just to expand on, on that point a bit, this is a slide we've used for, for many years and we, we update it every year. Uh, the blue line shows actual receipts to the state road use tax fund going back to 1997. And you can see there's been pretty good growth every year in that. Uh, the slope gets higher uh, when we have the time 21 enacted and some vehicle registration fee increases. And then it increased even more when we uh, had the fuel tax increase in 2015. Uh, the challenge is what we see in the red line that uh, shows in constant buying power back to 1997. 
using our actual real data for construction costs in Iowa. Uh, that shows the buying power. And so you can see in 2022, uh, our red dot is actually lower than it's been uh, in terms of buying power, even though we've had um, some good uh, funding increases and actually revenue is continuing to exceed forecast. Um, unfortunately, it's another good news, bad news. It's higher than forecast because car prices are higher. So not great if you're buying a car, but because uh, registration fees are tied to vehicle prices, that's provided some growth. So again, inflation is a real challenge. I, I'll just add as a side note, uh, the commission just received a recommendation from our public transit team for the allocation of formula bus replacement money statewide from fiscal year 22. And um, that recommendation was to make that funding available for all the outstanding bus orders that have already been placed, but haven't been able to be fulfilled because bus prices have grown so dramatically. So really all one year formula money is just going to cover increased costs and bus prices. Um, now we are uh, hoping with this appropriation bill, we hope to get the next week to get an, another year of bus replacement money and put that towards new buses again. But again, inflation is challenging a lot of different areas. Just a couple other transportation investments that have, have happened. Uh, we had a great appropriation from the legislature uh, for our fiscal year 22 modal programs. We got a record amount of funding for our state rec trails program, our two aviation vertical infrastructure programs, um, the public transit infrastructure program and our railroad investment program. So I really appreciate those appropriations from the legislature and they've been put to great use by um, um, jurisdictions across the state. Uh, in addition, Governor Reynolds used uh, some of the, the flexible uh, American Rescue Plan state fiscal recovery funds to support Iowa's commercial service airports. Uh, she allocated $100 million one-time money that was allocated to Iowa's eight commercial service airports for vertical infrastructure needs. And then also using some of those other funds, uh, Governor Reynolds has a Destination Iowa program uh, administered by the Iowa Economic Development Authority and um, several uh, large trail projects have been funded across Iowa with those funds. Okay, just real quick, a couple comments about this new all systems overweight permit. Uh, this is something that the ag sector has been really uh, interested in. Um, in Iowa, this is a new permit created by the legislature last session. It takes effect this January 1. Uh, it's a permit where um, uh, a truck can be registered uh, for $500 a year to travel at higher weights than what are otherwise allowed in Iowa code. Basically, at 12% uh, higher weights. Um, those uh, vehicles can travel on any US or Iowa route, not the interstate. Interstate is subject to federal 80,000 pound restrictions. But for all other US and Iowa signed routes, they can travel at those higher weights on, that, on those routes. And then when you get off the state highway system, it has to be on designated city and county roads and streets. So each city and county has to designate whether any of their roads or streets will be part of this permitting system, which is a really important point. And this applies to both divisible and non-divisible loads. Non-divisible are you know, big cranes or pieces of equipment that can't be broken down into smaller loads. Uh, divisible typically means like hauling grain, um, sand, aggregate. So you can see why the ag sector is very interested in this permit. They want to be able to travel at heavier weights across the state to make fewer trips um, to haul their product. Um, by the Iowa law, uh, counties have until July 1, 2025 to identify which roads uh, are part of this designated permitted system. Um, counties that do designate uh, roads to be part of this permitted system have a little bit of an incentive in that a portion of that $500 permit fee is allocated to those counties uh, to be able to spend on any activity on their bridges. So there's been a lot of confusion because we already have an existing all systems permit. Uh, the existing all systems permit is just for oversized vehicles. This new one is for overweight vehicles. Uh, both are similar in that they require city and county designations, uh, but they're different designations. So there's two different maps and you need to pick the right map see which roads you can travel overweight on with this permit. 
So I have links to those maps below. And then just as an example, here's, here's a current state. Well, this was current as of a week ago, and this may even be out of date because we're hearing from more and more counties and cities. But as of about a week ago, uh, all the counties in yellow are counties that have not taken any action yet to designate. Uh, the counties in red are counties that have uh, taken action and said they are not participating in this permit. So no roads are eligible to be traveled uh, using the permit. And then we have one county that doesn't show up real well here in white, um, that is Hardin County. Uh, they said all of the county roads uh, are eligible to travel on this permitted, um, on this permit. Um, the key is you have to zoom into the map then to see the specific roads and what's happening at the city level. So here I zoomed in to Hardin County, again, really hard to see on this map, easier if you get the, pro, the PowerPoint itself, but uh, you can see as you zoom into Hardin County, um, all the county roads in green, uh, that means they're all eligible to be used on this new permit. Um, but you can see every city in Hardin County is yellow because they have not taken any action. So that means permitted loads in Hardin County can travel on the state system, US and Iowa routes, not the interstate, uh, or any county road, but not on any, any city street. So thanks for letting me talk a little bit about that. Again, there's been a lot of interest and confusion, so I wanted to take advantage of, of this time to just talk a little bit about that. Um, we have time for any sure. questions? Yes, yes sir. Sure. So, so let's talk about this OA permit stuff. How many trucks are we actually expecting to participate in? Um, I, I don't think we have a good sense for that. Um, I know there is a lot of interest in it. Um, we hear from about every ag group that exists in Iowa. Um, now, I think a lot of their interest is based on, I think their assumption that this applied to all roads. So um, I think if this was a really expansive system, we'd be, we'd be getting a lot of permits. Um, you know, now we're trying to educate to make sure they understand that before you spend the 500, understand what your constraints are, that may limit uh, the interest at least early on. Well, just quick math, we have 10,000 permits applied. There's 10,000 people farming all whatever. 500 bucks, it's $5 million a year across the entire state that you divvy it out. That doesn't cover the wear and tear of those streets. Right, and that's certainly the, 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 the challenge that counties in particular and cities as well are having is there's a trade-off between um, the, and it's primarily a bridge issue. Um, what's the impact on bridges um, uh, versus, of course, counties desire to also support the efficient movement of ag products, but very much a trade-off. And yeah, it probably doesn't, well, not probably, I would agree it doesn't cover the, the costs. Where do the $500 come from? So, so $500 is the fee that the owner of the truck pays, and it's for the truck. Who decided the $500? That, that's what was in the legislation. Yep. Yep. The other thing is, if you get off the route, well, no, the second, first one, you have to have the license on the truck then for the 107 for 54 ton. You have to license the truck for that. I, I believe you do have to have it registered for the, the gross weight that you're traveling at. But so you're starting to get a little out of my area there, yeah. Okay. And the other thing is, the driver gets off that route, the overweight fine would probably be ten or $15,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. what, what's the process for just um, eliminating it? I think you can see some of the counties are going for it. I think it's just, uh, a, a, it's probably a resolution from the county that's submitted to the DOT. Yep. We've been fighting bridges for years and we're just starting to get closer and then they throw this at us. That's yeah. just like, wow. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dude, Mike Stein is Jackson County. So you're well aware of Jackson County and we're very fortunate to have the, the topography that we have with the bluff and the streams and the, um, you know, so yeah, when we talk about bridges, we talk about 250 of them. So I wonder what's all calculated into this uh, allocation is is our population of 18,000, our tax base with minimal manufacturing um, number of bridges, length of bridges. We're very fortunate to have the Coconut River, but we have five of them that are four to 600 feet long. 
really tough for a small county to maintain that kind of infrastructure. Yeah. I don't know what goes into the formula, but um, a county of 18,000 trying to maintain that kind of wages is almost impossible. So a lot of those factors are included in the formula for allocating secondary road funds and farm to market funds. But, but yeah, none of that went into, at least as far as I'm aware. I mean, we took one down with Coker River, across the Coker River last year. I mean, the, the road count was minimal, but, you know, and if it was in poor shape, of course, but. Uh, yeah, we've certainly heard, heard yeah. that, yeah. So Processes. why, yeah, if we're doing this for the small roads, why, why can't we do the interstate? Why don't they want it? Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. they're designed for it. And we are. I think that yep. Nope, that is, you couldn't agree with you more. You know, the interstate is the most highly designed system in in, uh, in the state and in the country. And so, uh, yes, it is a little um, ironic that it has the most significant restrictions. You know, I think we, uh, it is all guided by federal statute. And we do think it's a, a discussion that Congress needs to have. You know, as we're talking about driver shortages and you know, the need to reduce emissions, you can do that by hauling more. Of course, you hear about safety concerns, and of course you hear about railroads complaining about unfair competition, uh, but we think it's a discussion that should happen. Yes, sir. This is kind of ironic, because I was sitting here at 10.30 and had a green hauler call me yeah. uh, from right north of Edgewood, and he wants to know when we're gonna implement it because he had just talked to a state senator and said, uh, we're all good. You just got to get these counties on board. <laughs> and so he called me this morning to last in. I must have known you were uh, going to get that call. Yeah, I mean, we're getting a huge number of calls. We're trying to trying to get the word out because it's confusing. And then yeah. a question about your cities. Is that a population or do all of our small communities in our county need to have a resolution whether they go through? So Earlville, for instance, has a lot of truck traffic today. So, so if the city is okay with allowing these heavier permanent trucks, then that does require the, the city to do a resolution authorizing that. Uh, if, if there's no resolution authorizing that, they're not allowed. Hey, Stu, yeah. this is Todd Kinney, I'm online. Um, just, a, I guess, a statement and a couple follow-up questions of that. So um, if a county is going to allow the over the statewide permit for the overweight, first of all, you would need to analyze the bridges on the roads you want to consider being part of this to make sure they can handle the additional, it's a 12% increase in the live load moment, basically is what it comes down to the five, six, and seven axle trucks. The question I have is, um, for counties to get some of this $500 permit fee, how many, how many road sections do we have to, um, evaluate and and determine that they can handle the legal the, the the upsize and the live load moments for those trucks and then what is that percentage of the five hundred dollars that we will get if we do number one is how many miles do we have to include in our system if we evaluate like i can think of a couple main corridors that i know a lot of our oversize of our weight permit haulers use but if it's just if it's going to be mostly grain haulers and they want to go all over the county, it's going to be a lot more difficult. So number one is how many routes do we have to designate as um, uh, being eligible for this all systems permit? And then what would our percentage of that five hundred dollars be? Yep, great question. So uh, the legislation does not dictate a minimum um, percentage of the system that has to be designated. So certainly I think uh, it'd be fair for a county to you know, identify maybe the most important corridors initially uh, and designate those. Of course, a designation can change at any time, so that could grow over time. Um, so, so any designation at all uh, allows um, access to those funds. Um, the allocation of those funds uh, is determined by administrative rules. Um, right now, the initial allocation is gonna be allocated equally amongst uh, counties that have designated. Um, that may change over time as we get more, uh, more counties. Um, so, so right now, Hardin County is the one county that has designated, uh, and this will be done on a monthly basis. Um, so right now, any permits issued in the first month would go all to Hardin County. Again, not expecting a, a lot of that, but then if we had 
three counties the next month, they'd be allocated equally amongst those, those three counties and, and so forth. So how much money are we talking, Stu? That's what I, what's the nitty gritty of this? Uh, I, I wish I could tell you. Uh, I don't think anyone can guess. Again, it's the question about how many permits, what's the demand gonna be initially? Um, so so we'll be all be learning together once we uh, get past the month of January, the first month. Yeah. Is that- yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Doug. Is that gonna be available, like the, the data for, for how much, how many permits are collected in the disbursement and that kind of thing, so we can get an idea, um, you know, to open up a lot of your system to for fifteen hundred dollars worth of permit fees is doesn't make a lot of sense. So I, I'm a little hesitant to to go number one to do the evalu evaluations we need to do on all the bridges on the systems we want to consider, and then number two is is that money going to offset the the you know care and upkeep of the road system. Yeah, so definitely that data will be available. Local systems as part of that process. So I'm sure they'll uh, figure out a way to make that available to help make more informed decisions. Yeah, you have a question. I was curious, since uh, Pete Bushman, Delaware County, uh, have there been any guesstimates as to how many, is this something every grain, potentially every grain hauler could apply for or every a log truck or has people discussed how many there might be in this new hauler? Yeah, so um, so yeah, and any any hauler could apply for it. Again, it's a 500 per truck, so not per company. Which is not a lot of the question. Yeah, right. Yep, yep. So so yes, any can apply. Again, gets back to the question. We have no idea to forecast how many that'll be. So in Jackson County, we have Interstate 61 dissecting the county and you can't get on that road with the uh, truck. That, that's way. that's a US designated highway. So so that's eligible for the permit. Yep, so, so one is eligible. US 61 is, yep. So it's only the interstate. So interstate 35, 80, 380, 29, 235. 61 and interstate? No. Nope. No. Nope. No. Nope. Yeah. It travels yeah. interstate. But it's not an interstate system. Okay. Yep. Not know that. Yeah. Anything else? Stu, can you give us an update on the roadside vegetative management program? Um, well, anything in particular? I mean, there hasn't been, so we have a, we have a roadside uh, program, a living roadways program. Uh, it has a couple different components. There's uh, some funding we, we get. Um, through the REAP program to support mm -hmm. that. Uh, and there's also some funding we provide uh, to support the community visioning program uh, that we consider part of the Living Roads program. And then we also set aside some state uh, primary road fund every year to do roadside vegetation along state highways. So we, we do a state effort along our, our inner, within our right-of-ways on the state system. We also administer programs for cities and counties to apply and we support them developing integrated roadside vegetation management plans. Um, we Some of our statewide alternatives program money, um, we set aside annually to UNI's uh, Prairie Center to provide seed. Uh, so we have a lot of different areas. Um, none of those have been uh, significantly changed in recent years. So they're all, all continuing as, as they have. So I drive the 30 between here and Des Moines. There's major reconstruction, yep. which is good. Yep. And I'll be able to get off the highway. Um, but I don't see any roadside vegetation management so far going on there. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, that it, it takes time for that to build out. It's certainly always part of all of our plans. And of course, we just finished up the stretch in uh, Tama County. So typically after we finish construction, the following years when we do more of the permanent erosion control and roadside vegetation. And then of course that takes a couple of years to really start showing progress. Um, the Benton County piece of course is under construction now. So that'll, that will follow uh, as we get there. But yeah, that's always part of all of our construction pro projects. Just takes a while to see the benefit of those. So my second question relates back to EVs. Yeah. Last year we did a bill expanding uh, e to E15 and the big, the mantra was fuel choice for consumers. Um, electric vehicles, fuel choice, we should have more charging stations, you would think. Does DOT, uh, have you looked into asking for a state appropriation to supplement the federal money so you can expand beyond those primary corridors? 
we have not, at least at this time, we, uh, what we have done at the state level, and, and we're actually pretty fortunate in that um, the DOT uh, in Iowa administers those Volkswagen settlement funds. And um, we, uh, we took advantage of the maximum allowable allocation of those money for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, which is 15%. So we've actually at the DOT administered three years of charging infrastructure using the Volkswagen funds. Um, so it is great because that gave us some experience in administering these funds. But those were at like a million dollars around, and now we're going to have about $10 million around. I think what our what our perspective is is there's such a massive influx in money across the country for charging infrastructure. Uh, it's going to be challenging enough to get this federal money to be spent, um, both administratively, getting the compliant chargers. Uh, I think we want to let that play out here a few years and then kind of reassess uh, whether there's a value for additional state investment. Stu, are you putting these, is the state itself putting the chargers in like rest areas? Or are you assisting travel plazas yeah. installing them? Or? I'm glad you asked that. Um, uh, so we're planning to make this funding available through an application program. Uh, we expect the applicants will be the convenience stores, truck stops, uh, could be any landowner that has land uh, within a mile of the interstate and has amenities and shelter and can be open to the public 24-7, uh, which is why probably why that more focuses on convenience stores and truck stops. Uh, it will not be at our rest areas. Um, there are federal regulations that prohibit the state from uh, providing retail services at our rest areas, so we don't have an unfair competition with the private sector. Um, so we won't be doing that at the rest areas, but uh, they, you'll be you'll be seeing them again within a mile of the interstate, at least every 50, 50 miles. And they will be for profit charging stations. Yes. Yep. Yes, they will. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any cost estimates? I mean, what's it cost to charge a car to go 300 miles? Oh, well, I don't, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, generally, um, uh, pretty consistently, it's been cheaper than what it costs to fuel your your vehicle uh, with gasoline. Uh, but I don't have a good exact answer. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Well, thanks again, everybody, for having me. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today. That concludes our program. Um, happy holidays and uh, look forward to 2023. Thank you very much. I asked that report. Oh, yes, that report. Yeah, I'm not sure. You're fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.